Welcome to Below Average Gaming. I'm your host, the Below Average Gamer, and today we'll be discussing the new movie, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Now, I know that this movie has gotten a ton of flack, or should I say, Affleck, for its casting, writing characters, and overall unwillingness to give comic fans what we deserve in a DC movie ever since Batman the movie. Yeah, I, I didn't want to see that again. Well, let's get started. Let's start with some grievances that people have regarding the cast. Since Ben Affleck graced us with his presence as the latest rendition of the Dark Knight, fans have been going ballistic. Not that kind of ballistic, but very, very close. And while I do agree that seeing him in the new beefy bat suit took some time to get used to, seeing Affleck as an older, more rugged Bruce Wayne was, well, a spot-on fit. He was very similar, very, very close to the one that we had in the, the Dark Knight Returns, the animated movie, the second part where he actually does go up against Batman in that big mechanical suit. And I think that is a great, awesome thing that they did where they brought that into the movie. It was a really good transition um, from animation into live action. And I think we can all agree that there were some things that did deserve to be cut out. Yikes. Is that a mask or are those glasses? What are you doing? And clearly, you are. your hair is very stylized. People know who you are. People know who you are. I understand you're kind of a loser in high school. But whatever. I just, I'm really glad that some things were cut from the movie, to say the least. And with a movie that was surprisingly more focused on the humanity of Bruce Wayne than previous portrayals, in my opinion, Affleck stole the show. And in my book, he has quickly become one of my favorite Batman. Um, a lot of the story takes place in flashbacks, like an uncomfortable amount, like a disproportionate amount, like an unfollowable amount. But I think this does add to the character of Bruce Wayne, who is not only weighed down by the death of his parents, but in this version, also by the death of Jason Todd. I mean, seriously, who keeps letting this guy adopt kids? That's my one question. It's like Bruce Wayne, billionaire genius, playboy, philanthropist, all this crazy cool stuff, like five kids have died in his care, and yet they keep on being like, oh yeah, send another, whatever. Now we all know Batman's one rule. Batman doesn't kill people. Well, except for the guy he slams face first into the floor, breaking his neck. Or the one he knocks a grenade from their hand to kill them and their two henchmen. Or the ones he blows up with a car explosion that'd make Michael Bay rock hard. Not to mention the dozen dudes he mows down with a machine gun, not once, but twice. And I do have to say that it is a bit hard to handle watching Batfleck 86, like 86 dudes within the first hour. But you have to remember that this is an aged and rugged Batman who has been at the game for about 20 years. He mentions that his parents were killed in 1981, and if he was 10 at the time, that would make him 45 the movie is taking place. And given that he trained for roughly 5 years in the League of Shadows, and add in a few years out of high school, he's been fighting crime for, yeah, around 20 years, which does give him that expertise and experience over Superman, which he definitely needs in this fight. But what about college? Surely he went to college, you may be asking. Well, in some of the earlier Batman comics, Bruce Wayne did have a few degrees in chemistry and engineering. But the Nolan Batman in both his movies and his trilogy doesn't seem to have any higher education. He seems very, very young when he goes and tries to kill uh, Joe Chill in the Batman trilogy. But uh, I think a lot more can be said in the conversation between he and Lucius Fox. Like I said, he had some degrees in the comic books, uh, among chemistry, engineering, and many others. But in the conversation with Lucius Fox, Lucius has said, I analyzed your blood, isolating the receptor compounds in the protein-based catalyst. Bruce Wayne then responds, am I meant to understand any of that? If Bruce Wayne had any chemistry training, he would have understood some basics of Lucius's work. But if we can use this as evidence in the same universe, both the Nolan universes, we can say he's been on the job for about 20 years. Right out of high school, probably. So Batman's pretty done with humanity at this point, and while he doesn't necessarily go out of his way to kill anyone, I'm sure he's at the point to brush off a few casualties from time to time. I mean, Superman has the same rule, and turned all of Metropolis to dust in his first week as Superman. The entire movie opens up with the chaos and catastrophe caused by what they call the Superman Incident. It divides the planet into two sides, one being for Superman, one against. The people for see him as a god come to help them, come to save people, and there's a lot of scenes that do show him saving people from events that otherwise they wouldn't be able to escape. But at the same time, we have this whole military idea, this idea that there's something going on 
deep undercover covert to frame him and the american people along with the rest of the world see him as a menace wanting him for trial for jury wanting him to stand up against the people and take his punishment whatever it may be and that's the case where lex luther steps in almost as a good guy as a deterrent to superman and that's the phrasing that he uses he uses himself saying that he will create a deterrent for this superman i really didn't have any issues with luther until i saw the movie myself and can I just say that I truly hated the character, and not for the reasons that the studio probably wanted me to. Yes, he was eccentric, but his mannerisms danced on the edge of junior high drama class, where the shy kid has to step out of his comfort zone. But it was almost like he was trying really hard not to be a Joker clone, so he was constantly at a level 4 out of 10 on the charisma scale. We were first introduced to the character playing some basketball in his company lobby, because he's a fun boss. And after taking a moment to throw in one of those Mr. Luther was my father's name jokes, we can be reminded how hip and cool he is as we're taken to an uncomfortable scene where Lex force feeds an older businessman a Jolly Rancher Fifty Shades of Grey style. Yum. After that, while Lex is taking advantage of the perks that come with being rich, we get a close-up of his converse to match his light blue suit, since remember, he's a fun boss, in case they don't need to remind us of that over and over and over again. His mannerisms, his speech, all this stuff kind of mixes together to be this really awkward and uncomfortable character. And yeah, he's not meant to be the most likable guy in the world, but it's almost like he is shy, but he's putting on this hoax to look eccentric. It's just a really weird mix. And I don't know what direction that was, because Jesse Eisenberg usually plays those characters really well. I mean, we've seen him in Social Network, where he goes from awkward to controlling and a little bit manipulative. We've seen him in Now You See Me, and the second Now You See Me, which I guess they probably should have called Now You Don't, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, in the second one, he does play that manipulative character, the one who's smart and always on the up and up. But here is a very different Jesse Eisenberg, and I don't know if that's something that they did intentionally, saying we don't want you to play your normal characters, or if it was something by mistake, because this character does seem like quite a mistake. So hip, cool catchphrases and awkward junior high acting aside, the character did have some redeeming qualities that I can't really place at the moment, but I'm sure we're there. He did have that long red hair as a reference to some early illustrations, and even wore the extravagant suits like in the original Superman movies. But I just couldn't take him as seriously as I'd like to. The use of flashbacks, visions, and omens was a great tool used to convey the character's motives and reasonings. It's a shame that 97% of the movie was all a dream. Wait a minute. Nolan? Dreaming? Visions? Was the whole thing just an... Oh, God. Quick, someone create an obscure and overkill rig to wake me rather than just throw some water on me. The movie starts out with a quick and emotional trip to remind us all just who Batman is, while still giving us a new totem to grasp onto throughout the movie. The name? Martha. Martha is seen whispered by his father as... And again, spoiler alert if you don't know the origin of Batman, his parents are killed in an alley. His dad whispers Martha, and it's repeated over and over throughout the movie. And for some reason, it ends up being the thing that snaps Batman into thinking, Oh, hey, Superman and my mom have the same name. Maybe we should instantly be best friends and stop fighting each other. Sorry I tried to kill you with a kryptonite spear. It's a weird thing to grasp onto, but you know, I found myself really liking that whole idea because it linked Batman and Superman, and I could really see the idea that they were trying to convey that these characters are more alike than they are different. One flashback is great. Two is good in proper succession. Three is a bit excessive, but when the Flash leaps through a computer to show you a post-apocalyptic vision of the future, despite the fact that broadcasting visions isn't quite in his realm of ability, then perhaps you're taking things a leap too far. Seriously, though, he has to be the only superhero to travel back in time and apologize for being too early with the info. So let me set up the scene for you. We've been doing a lot of build-up. Things have been going kind of slow recently. We haven't really had a big Batman-Superman fight yet. And uh, Batman is analyzing some data that he's gotten. He's on 1%, 2%, going really slowly, when all of a sudden we have this big crazy jump scare. And you see that scene that we've all been really confused about from the trailers, the big desert fight war scene with the uh, demons coming out of the sky, the big Omega symbol, which, um, after seeing the movie, after hearing some of those little quotes kind of slipped in and seeing where the movie leaves us, it seemed very, 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 very clear that they are leading up to Darkseid being the main villain, which will be really fun to have that right alongside um, Thanos in the Avengers. But, again, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, um, 
yeah, we have this big crazy scene, and then we come back to Bruce just staring at Flash coming through a rip in space-time, telling him a couple things. First off, he tells him that he was right about Superman. He was right about Superman all along. Then he says to save her, save Lois. Lois is the key. Now, both seem a little cryptic at the time, and I can tell you this, watching the movie, still a little cryptic. I have no idea what's happening, what's going on with that. So, yeah, there's that whole thing. And then he says, oh, wait, I'm too early. I'm too early. Slips back, ignore everything that I just said. So, yeah, we're kind of left in this weird, awkward spot, not knowing if we can really trust what he said, what he showed Batman. Again, regardless of the fact that that's not really his ability. But, yeah, the whole idea of, look, it's Flash, he's here. There's his cameo. Okay, bye. I mean, they promised us cameos, and there they were, but do they really count? About midway through the movie, Batman recovers a stolen flash drive that he stole from Luther, but was stolen by Wonder Woman before he could steal it from Luther. Whatever. And that has some random recordings of various metahumans, including Cyborg, Flash, and Aquaman. Also, either Luther invented the logos for these characters in some free time on Photoshop, or these apparently undiscovered superheroes sent Luther some early concept art of their symbols. Because somehow, even though these heroes aren't heroes yet, he has the logos that we've all come to know and love as these characters' logos, all on the flash drive. So where did those come from, dude? Like, did you make these superheroes? What's up with that? And whoa, there's some footage of a guy disappearing right when a red lightning bolt stops a convenience store clerk from being shot in the face. That must be Flash, I can tell by the red lightning bolt. Hey, there's a weird cube thing that needs no explanation, and we're going to pretend that it's uh, perfectly normal to exist in this world, and it suddenly fuses with a man who's torn in half. And it suddenly Cyborg is born. We hear him screaming, coming to life. It's amazing. It's fantastic. And then there's some footage of Aquaman's face for a solid 10 seconds. Because they promised us Aquaman in this movie, and we can't go calling Nolan a liar now, can we? Now, I was really scared that Wonder Woman would become kind of a sidekick to Batman and Superman, but she seriously stole the show, in my opinion. During the Doomsday fight scenes, I found myself wondering how the other two could possibly keep up with her. Shout out to Chris Pines, by the way, for showing up out of nowhere in the photo of Wonder Woman from back in the day. Look, I get it, DC. I get you're trying to keep up with Marvel and you have like six months to catch up, but honestly, take the time to do that. You have Flash, a character who no one really understands his powers unless they're super into comic books, and you're trying to just show him off and be like, look, ooh, that's a mystery, I wonder what that's going to be. You show Aquaman, who everyone knows is kind of the lame superhero, you make him cool, and then you only tease us a couple seconds. And then there was Cyborg, which no one asked for. No one needed. But you, for some reason or another, felt the need to push that character onto us. Whatever. And if you're going to be having this big picture of like, oh my god, Wonder Woman is from the 1930s, and prior she says that she's 600 years old, and then you're going to put a super famous actor right behind her? Come on, man. Seriously? You think that we're not going to get the picture? Like, yeah, you're trying to tease us for another movie. It's it's not working. It's really just not working for you. I do wish that there was some more explanation as to Wonder Woman's character, though. She seriously pops up like twice in the entire movie before she reveals herself as Wonder Woman. And at both those times, yeah, she is just as cool as Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent. But, you know, there's no explanation to the character. It's just, oh, she might be a superhero. Let me digress and kind of tell you what happens. Shameless plug that Bruce Wayne finds her in a photo from way back, suggesting that there may be more to her than meets the eye, and we just lost Michael Bay again. Suddenly she's a superhero fighting alongside the dynamic duo. No explanation as to why or who or what the connection is between these three. Also, does she have any idea what's going on because she kind of just sees Doomsday on TV and runs into battle. Has no idea that there's a feud going on between the dynamic duo Batman and Superman. Just kind of hops in there. Nolan gives her this crazy sword that apparently can cut through the same substances that can pierce through Superman's chest, and a shield that blocks a laser beam cast by something that was able to survive a nuclear blast when Superman could barely do that himself. But I guess there's no need to explain any of that, right? Her lasso of truth also seems to suddenly appear, and I guess the layman viewer just has to deal with the shiny golden lasso that can hold the demon monster back when Superman didn't stand a chance. I mean, of all the characters on there to not have their name in the title... You give the OP one, not title credit. You take the biggest, strongest, coolest character of the entire movie, in my opinion, and you don't even give her top credit. Honestly, you weren't going to give her a movie, you're not going to put her on the title for this movie, and then you leave her to the last 20 seconds of the movie. <laughs> like, it's a big fight scene, there she is, she's gone, let's go back to Superman and Batman stuff. 
because no one cares about Diana Prince, apparently. So there's this big fight between Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne on who's going to get this big chunk of kryptonite that was found in the ocean. Might I suggest that might have been a good way to introduce Aquaman rather than just saying, oh, by the way, he exists in this world. Yeah, giant rock that falls to the bottom of the ocean and is retrieved in like a little village somewhere. That's kind of right up Aquaman's alley. But I digress. Anyway, there's this big cluster of kryptonite that uh, it's never actually called that in the movie, but we know what it is. And Batman is trying to steal it from Lex Luthor, and Lex Luthor is using that as his one means to deter Superman just in case things go bad. When in reality, we all know that Lex Luthor just hates Superman. Batman uses this stolen kryptonite, which apparently that's what he does now, he just steals stuff, and he uses it to make canisters that spray gas of kryptonite so that when inhaled by Superman, he becomes temporarily weaker, almost able to die. Batman finds a way to kill Superman which is what the entire world has been looking for this entire time. So he does that. He also makes this spear, which is interesting because he just made a gun that fires these canisters of kryptonite gas, but he won't make a gun that fires a kryptonite bullet. They even reference silver bullets and the golden bullet and making a kryptonite bullet several times, but yet Batman decides to make a spear. Now, the thing about spears is that they're made so that they can jab and retract easily. So let's have Superman hold it upside down so that he can only strike from close combat so that he can get stabbed in the chest and killed by the monster. Never mind the fact that A, Batman made a spear when he could have made a gun. Superman is probably the worst person to wield this spear. You have Diana Prince, who I just said has they've made a really underrated character, even though she's the best one, who has been trained with weapons just like this, and you don't give her the spear. Give her the spear. Please. A lot of people were upset with the first Man of Steel movie because uh, Superman's trying to save the city and in doing so destroys it. Completely decimates Metropolis. Well, in this movie they actually have an out. When they're doing the big fight scene, Doomsday actually lands on an uninhabited island, which I believe is called Stryker Island. So while he's on Stryker Island, it's like fantastic. They can have a huge fight scene, no one's going to get hurt, and no one has to put the same issues on this movie that they had with Man of Steel, saying they just destroyed an entire city. And then Batman flies over and says, I have to get him to Gotham. That's where the spear is. It's a spear. Go to Gotham, pick it up, come back, and then use it. But no, he's like, I gotta lead him to Gotham, because Metropolis we just destroyed, now we're gonna destroy this. They even make a point to say in news reports, for some reason or another, it's a good thing that the work day is over and there's virtually no one in the downtown district. If you're paying that close enough attention to make sure that you find some really weird convoluted way to make sure that there's no one in town, just leave him on the abandoned island. You had an out. You had every opportunity to fix the issue that you had with the first one, but you made it worse by having him destroy a completely separate town. Anyway, that's probably the first of many reviews on this movie that I'll do. It had a lot of issues. That's true. No one's going to argue that. It did have a lot of issues. But again, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Looking past the fact that Batman murdered several dozen people in cold blood, Luther acted more like a freshman drama student than a criminal mastermind, and the best character getting mostly cut from the script, it was a decent movie. I mean, there were really cool action scenes. I loved watching Wonder Woman fight alongside the other two while Batman kind of ran away. Um, her action scenes were fantastic, and her music for that was great. I've never been upset with a Hans Zimmer score before. There was really fun dynamic between Batman, Superman, and then really awesome dynamic between Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne. We get to see a little bit more of Lois Lane and Superman, um, the relationship on them, than we have seen before. And yes, I know a lot of people are going to say, you know, it's not, it's not the Batman and Superman that they're used to. Well, you have to think, in order to get this story to fit well into that universe, they do have to move some things around. They do have to set this with an older Batman. And I like the idea. I like the idea that the older Batman is fighting the younger, and he's only been Superman for three years. Because that gives Batman the edge that he needs. That gives him the experience on fighting these creatures, monsters, aliens, villains, whatever. He has the experience to fight Superman. He even says it multiple times, that he's dealt with clowns before. So even though it isn't the best movie, it was a pretty decent film. Thanks for watching Below Average Gaming. I'm the Below Average Gamer, and remember, save Martha.